Right, um, welcome to the Armboff. Um, Hector and I are here at the front. Um, Konstantinos should have been here, but he's in the middle of a panic um, house move at the moment, so couldn't make it this week. So we can say all kinds of silly things about him, and he can't talk back. <laughs> um, obviously, we're all Debian developers. We are lucky enough to be employed by people who are happy to happy that we're Debian developers and wanted to spend some of our work time on making ARM stuff work better in Debian. Um, more about that a bit later. So, quick agenda. Be believe me, as I said, this is not a lecture. We want you lot to take part as well, but a quick agenda of the things that, that I've got on my list. Please, by all means, shout if there's anything else you want to talk about, and we'll try to get to it all. So, we c there are four, I suppose, different ARM ports that people have worked on in, De in and around Debian. We have the current ARM port, which is mostly dead. Uh, the last re it last released with Lenny, so once Lenny finishes uh, security support, we will stop supporting the old ARM ABI. Um, so, there are some people out there with some seriously old hardware who we were going to stop supporting. It's, there's not much we can do about that. We can't support everything at all, at all ends of the scale. Um, there was the ARM EB, which never hit Debian, although there are some weird people out there still using it, I'm told. We have the current ARM EL uh, port, which in Debian supports ARM v4t onwards, but in Ubuntu is targeted at v7. Please, hands up in the audience, do, do we all understand what v4t and v7 and things like that mean? Does anybody not? Okay, the ARM architecture has gone through multiple different ver versions, um, not just the actual names used by the chips, but they have different instruction set versions. Um, v4 is, the, is now really quite old. v4t is version 4, but with support for the thumb instruction set as well. We've moved on v5, v6, v7. v7 is the current um, architecture that ARM are pushing. It's what you see in things like the Tegra, the very latest um, chips from TI and Freescale. It's, it's the current thing that everybody really is, is using in current mobile phones that are shipping today. Endian. Yes. Um, now, the latest thing right at the end of that list is ARMHF. This is the new um, ARM port that we are bootstrapping. Um, the difference between ARMEL and ARMHF is that is very, very subtle. Um, both will run on exactly the same hardware. Um, well, ARMEL will happily run on V7. ARMHF, we're targeting V7 and up only. It could technically run on earlier hardware, but it's not worth doing. I'll come to that in a moment. Um, the big difference is in terms of floating point hardware. From V7 onwards on ARM, you can rely on having hardware floating point support. Previously, you couldn't. Um, however, the ARMEL ABI is designed around coping without hardware floating point. To do that, you end up passing all of your floating point arguments into functions using the integer registers of your CPU. Now, that, means, that does, means a lot of good things. If you don't have guaranteed hardware floating point, it means that you don't break. But it does mean that when you do have hardware floating point support, you end up taking the cost of copying arguments into and out of your integer registers on every single function call. Um, that's really, really slow if you're doing, if you're make, make calling into sh short functions that do two or three operations and then return, you can end up being swamped by the cost just of this overhead. Um, RMHF, we are targeting V7 in both Debian and Ubuntu. In fact, here you go, there's more, de more details here. Now, you can use the same kernel for both RMEL and RMHF. Um, the, the kernel is ABI agnostic, basically because the kernel does not do floating point itself. Um, 
you don't need to worry, therefore, about how you pass floating point arguments. Obvious, but it, it, it needs stating. So what we can do is run an army L kernel, and we're doing this on some of our machines, and you can happily have a Chirrut for now with ArmHF. Uh, once we have MultiArch up and running, then you will be able to have army L, ArmHF running MultiArch. There are some wrinkles around that, in that, of course, the two are not binary compatible. You cannot run and share any uh, libraries or processes in the same address space. They must all be con consistent one way or the other, otherwise things explode in interesting ways. So, um, Constantino started the RMHF bring up just about 12 months ago. We were talking about it um, last year in New York. Um, he's supported by the company he works for, Genesi. Um, they've given out loads and loads of their um, Ifica um, MX notebooks and little uh, net top machines to lots of people all over the world who are helping to, you know, just generally port more stuff to ARM, and in particular ARMHF. Um, he's been through and has bootstrapped ARMHF in the Debian ports archive, the vast majority of the normal archive builds. Um, the fun bits happen, to be honest, just like when you're bootstrapping any new port in Debian, is when you want to start building from the ground up. Um, the awkward things that don't depend on C at the bottom. So obviously, self-hosted languages, Java, Haskell, uh, C Lisp, there are probably others, but those are the three we keep on talking about. Um, each of those needs involved bring up, with ex typically with experts. Some of them have really good instructions, some of them it's a, it's a voyage of discovery. Uh, this, this is a Genesi laptop or netbook. Ooh. That uh, Constantinos is yeah. doing so, the RMHF work for. So. Yeah, Genesi have that's a. Right it's yeah. running RMHF Debian right now. It's pretty cool. So if you want to see it, he's he has it around. Yeah, that's an IMX fifty one, which is a Freescale CPU. Yes. They are Genesi are just moving over to the IMX fifty three, which is faster, has more features, and is generally good, but. It's really good, obviously. They have a vested interest in making ARMHF work because they get much better performance on that hardware. Lots of other folks are seeing the light too, to the extent that we're expecting most of the, the uh, system on chip vendors to be providing drivers and support for ARMHF real soon now. Discussion on IRC and on mailing lists suggests that almost everybody will be giving us even much as we, we may not care about it in Debian, things like the hardware, uh, 3D drivers, that kind of thing, the, even the binary blobs, of course, they need to be built compatibly with the rest of your system. So we're expecting our okay. major F versions of those too. So do we have? Well, you kind yeah. of explained Get it. Get the mic. Okay. I was wondering why the drivers need to support ARM HF, but yeah, if they're binary blobs, then yes, I understand. Yeah. yeah. Um, we are working together, there is a group of us, me, Hector, Konstantinos, a couple of other folks. Um, we are looking at inclusion into the main Debian archive for MHF real soon now. We are evaluating, we have a wiki page um, in, on the Linaro site, if I'm no, not, oh, sorry, the, on the Debian site wi rather. Wi wiki, Debian .org, yes. ARM, um, hard float, and then there's... Build D. Build D. Yeah. And, uh, they so just search for ARM hard float on the wiki. Yeah, there's a, a number of pages there. That's where Konstantinos has been tracking his status, showing what was working, what bugs have been posted. I said, we, we're evaluating about half a dozen different boards and we're just working out what the best options are. And we're hoping to get official Debian buildies up and running within, well, by the end of August. We know that most of the archive already builds, but of course we need to reboot strap inside the main archive from what we have. Um, that's the plan. Now, that is most of what I'm going to, that is what I'm going to say about RMHF. Do we have any questions, points, comments? Lots. Go. Uh, the original ARM port was hard float. Um, yes. Which was a pain in the whatever for nearly everybody except for the one person in the world that had a floating point variant of a strong arm or something. Exactly, yes. <laughs> um, 
And the, the, the process there was that you uh, used your har hardware floating point processor and then were rescued by the kernel with the pretend one yeah, uh, at exactly. huge cost. Is that likely to be the same so that you can run, um, so that if you haven't got a floating point unit, um, you can run RMHF on... Ooh. No, I, you, no, no, nobody is thinking in those terms. The reason that we're targeting V7 onwards yeah. with our mate Jeff mm -hmm. is that you can rely on hardware floating point. Okay. Yeah. Um, you could bootstrap it yourself if you want on, old, on older hardware, but to be honest, there really is no, no gain to be made. Okay. The point is, as, as Nick says, the original ARM ABI, as, we're, as far as we're concerned in Debian, did expect hardware floating point, despite the fact about half a percent of all the boards ever shipped had it. So then the kernel would trap an illegal instruction error, um, take the exception, would deal with it, um, you know, with a, the kernel-based uh, floating point emulator, and then switch back, which then gave you a cost of about a, a hundred times slower than it needed to be. That was why we switched to the Army L, the new EABI, which then assumed that you didn't have hardware floating point. If you did need to do floating point operations, you could then do them in user land without that incredibly costly um, trap in kernel. So. Yeah, so um, would it be possible to mix ARMEL and ARM HF up with, uh, I mean, GCC has this calling convention, uh, things. Yeah. Uh, GCC uh, can usually, you, when compiling with GCC, you can specify calling convention to be used, like in, like in the x86 world, you can use, say yeah. STD call and things like that. Would it be possible to do something similar with ARMEL and ARMHF? Absolutely. One GCC, you can use exactly the same compiler binary to output either um, ABI. Um, but that's only a small part of the a small part of the solution, I guess. A small part of the problem. Um, so far, what we have, um, we've been doing a lot of cross compiling on a lot of native compiling, and we we deliberately target explicitly. We default to one or the other, so we have two tool chains. You can do it in one go. Absolutely. Right. Uh, yeah, I guess. Go on, P two, stand up. I guess ARM HF might make sense for if you're on an ARM 11, because I think most ARM 11 implementations do have floating point hardware. But they yeah, might not exactly. Have all we thought about it, but you, there is no guarantee that all ARM v6s will have will have floating point. That's why we picked v7. To be honest, also um, some of this work is sponsored by ARM and Linaro, who of course are trying to sell. Uh, Admittedly, yeah, the latest versions, you know, the newest shiny ARM processor. So of course we're going to target the latest, but it is also, you know, there are lots of the lots of real devices out there using uh, V7 processors now. That's what we're targeting. And presumably, if you, it's on, it's on. Yeah. And presumably, if you statically link, just like you could have soft float under ARM. Uh, you can you can use old Army L stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Just, the, the old Army L stuff will still continue to work on the newer processors as well for the foreseeable. I don't expect we're, that we're necessarily going to kill the Army L port in Debian anytime soon before anybody panics. Uh, one more question: Does Army HF imply that Dump two instructions will be used, or is it orthogonal? That is a very good point. Yes, we are also as we can as we can expect that there will be Thumb two. Um, in ARMv7, we are going to be pushing for Thumb 2 in a lot of, a lot of cases, uh, which then gives, well, I've, again, I'm using terminology that not everybody may understand. Does, do, does anybody here want me to explain what ARM, Thumb, and Thumb 2 mean in terms of instruction sets? Right. Are we all that? Wonderful. Easy. Um, thumb 2 will allow us, of course, to use to significantly reduce the executable size, and, you know, the code size of the stuff you're running, which generally gives you, is expected to give you better performance just from reduced instruction cache hits. Um, it's no guarantee. Um, the one thing I haven't actually shown here, because I didn't quite manage to get all the details down yet, is we are doing benchmarks as part of the Lenora work on ArmHF, uh, Konstantinos has gone through and is doing a back-to-back -back comparison of ARMEL and ARMHF uh, binaries. I know Clint has some benchmarks as well from last year, if I remember correctly. Yeah. 
Um, there are places where you will not gain anything from the switch. We'll be totally open and honest about that. If you're running tight uh, in, you know, integer-based code, obviously changes to floating point format, fl floating point arguments are not going to be noticeable at all. Um, however, in code where you are expecting to be running a lot of floating point heavy, um, we've seen typically it, performance boosts could be anywhere from 10%, 30% on some particular, uh, not quite contrived, but probably not representative benchmarks, uh, Konstantinos is seeing a factor of two, two or three in performance improvement. Um, I think there's a, p the Povray renderer, for example, of course, is stuck. Um, it uses incredibly nested recursive code. Um, going up and down the stack of, rec of recursive functions with RML involves basically you're spending all of your CPU time just copying data in and out of registers. It's utterly pointless. So there are many places where we can gain. We'd expect that for a typical system these days, especially where people are wanting to get nice, shiny compositing desktops and everything, you will see a noticeable speed up by switching ABI. That's why we're doing all of this work. Um, if you want to see more details, again, um, search in the Debian wiki for, for Armhard Float and there are links to all of, all of the, the numbers that we have. Anything more that people would like to ask? Tom. <laughs> Two microphones. Uh, so th just a comment to follow up on that. Uh, one of the things that's going on in the upstream uh, Java community right now is a patch to the JDK for tail call optimization which will hopefully make uh, recursive calls much, much less expensive. And that would be of interest, of course, to, in this case, Java directly, yeah. but also particularly interesting for derived languages like Scala or Clojure that uh, use uh, recursive uh, idioms quite heavily. So, you know, stay tuned to that space and hopefully you know, trunk versions of the JDK will enable that. It'd be, it'd be really fun. Cool. Um, moving on from the RBL versus RMHF stuff, um, hands up anyone who hasn't heard about the, I guess, controversies going on on the Linux kernel mailing list in the last few months to do with ARM. <laughs> um, the Linux on ARM history is a complicated one. Um, the, unlike on x86 where you can basically target one or maybe two different machine types and know that, you know, you know because everything's an Intel, you know everything looks like a PC, you know where your serial ports live, you know where your memory lives, you know where all of your normal system uh, resources live in memory addresses, in terms of interrupts, and all of that, you can have a nice, simple, single architecture tree that basically, it, it, it's called i386, but it specifies it's a PC. ARM is more complicated. <laughs> um, the ARM, as a company, have taken a policy of not telling all of their licensees how to connect everything up. You know, they sell you um, the rights or license to use an ARM core or one of many ARM cores, but then so many different licensees, so many other actual chip manufacturing companies over the years have added their own IP around that, and they've all gone, they've covered almost every possible combination of how to connect things. Um, so you can't necessarily have a single ARM binary that will run on, any ARM, on every ARM CPU out there because, well, actually, in a lot of cases, the ARM CPU in the middle is actually or is tiny compared to, say, the video, um, yeah, the video componentry attached or to the onboard networking or to the cache or the memory. They're all connected totally differently. Um, that has led to a huge amount of fragmentation within the Linux kernel ARM, in the ARM community, and Linus has almost thrown his toys out of the pram about this in recent months. Um, if you look at the change logs on the later 2.6 kernels, you'll see moving from one to the next, typically 
it could be a huge proportion of the check-ins moving from one to the next, or the changes, are entirely within the arch arm tree. Um, that means that there's a lot of work out there just, be, just for what some people see as a small tree architecture. Those of us working on it, of course, see it as more important, but for a lot of people who, d who don't know the nitty-gritty, it looks just like there's a huge amount of churn for no reason. Now, in some cases that is true. There are, last, last time I, a friend of mine looked, there were 15, I think, different, almost identical UART serial drivers that, act, that did exactly the same job, but just had different addresses hard-coded as, as to where those UARTs lived. Um, it's been getting very messy for a while. Um, and there was a real, I guess, fear that Linus might actually just say, we've had enough of this, I'm not going to accept any ARM patches, I'm just going to throw it out, the, out of the kernel, you lot can fork it, and it's your own problem, this is too messy for me. There's been a lot of consternation about this, obviously, in the very large ARM community of people who are making money out of selling ARM processors, especially ARM processors running Linux and other free software. Um, Linaro and a lot of the people involved in Linaro are working on this. There is a real effort, a real push to consolidate how the different system on chip uh, families are supported in the kernel. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. Do people know who Linaro are in this room? Does anybody not? <laughs> we have one or two. Linaro is a uh, a non-profit group that is a consortium um, founded by OM and a number of their partners. So several of the system on chip vendors are involved. Um, even IBM are involved, not because they actually directly sell uh, um, OM system on chips. They just have a, have a vested interest. They manufacture them for lots of other people, for example. Um, it's an effort to basically take into the software world the, the ARM model in the hardware world. ARM does not ever make any actual real ARM CPUs. Instead, they sell the components and then they share out the cost of, manu the cost of developing those co components with all of their licensees. So people like um, TI, Freescale, NVIDIA, a whole bunch of other people pay a smaller cost to ARM for licensing those C those that core CPU than it would cost to develop themselves. That's a wonderful model. Arm are making reasonable amounts of money. They're paying for you know a lot salaries for lots of us. They're nice people. We like them. Um, in the software world, it's been utter chaos, and there's been nothing like that. Uh, which is what, one of the reasons why we've seen all of the different system on chip vendors shipping their own Linux trees, their own drivers, their own distributions. None of which actually seem to work all that well compared to what might happen if they just shared their work. You know, again, in this room, I doubt it's going to be a, a difficult sell to say, um, sharing what you're working on is a really good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so ARM started Linaro last year, and it's a consortium that's, that isn't necessarily to do with people putting money in. It's more a case of the various companies involved putting engineer time in. So Arm has a number of engineers in. I can't remember exactly how many. Wookie might remember. He's looking puzzled as well. So Arm and TI and Freescale and IBM and a number of six or nine, six or nine other um, large-ish companies you've, heard, you've all heard of because they're all shipping big devices got together to start with. Since then, there have been lots and lots other companies um, also putting engineer time in, small bits of funding in cases where it's necessary, but the main point is we're now actually working together, collaborating on making things work properly. You know, so this all feeds in. Lenaro are now pushing for consolidation in the, ARM, in the Linux kernel for ARM, and this, is, again, is being greeted by a lot of um, delight, almost, it seems, from the upstream folks and we're hoping it's going to work. Any questions, comments? I'm sorry, I'm rabbit rabbit I am rabbiting on here. Please shout if there's anything else you want to say, discuss. Well, Linaro is mostly caring about latest cores on RV7, and we still have devices, RV5, which 
we don't support in Debian, and, uh, uh, because, and there is no support in mainline kernels, and there is people working their own patch sets and maintaining their own uh, devices out of, out of three. So it might be interesting, maybe not Linaro, but some team within Debian trying to get these patches, organize them, and try to make some kind of nice patch set to send to upstream. So maybe we can have uh, RML kernels and support uh, devices properly yeah. on, uh, on the RML user land. Okay, P2. Uh, maybe a slightly side question, but when is a device to be compiled in Debian going to be updated to the latest version? <laughs> because it doesn't work at all for ARM at the moment. Oh, okay. I don't, yeah. Who's the maintainer? Aurelien uh, Jerome. Yeah. yeah, he's been uh, kind of inactive lately, so maybe an NMU. Or yeah, at, at the moment you have to f find out on the web where the Gitri is, where this thing lives, otherwise there is no way you can compile your own device. To oh, okay. Um, feel free to, talk, to grab me afterwards and I can talk through that with you. I mean, um, Grant Likely, who works with me in Lenaro, um, in the office of the CTO, is doing a lot of the pushing now upstream and is, base, is trying to get device tree accepted. We're hoping that in kernel 3.1 it should be usable for just about all of the current ARM uh, devices, you know, of the current brand new ARM devices at least. It's a it's a long road, but we're getting to we're getting there. Yeah, no, I've used this. Yeah, I've used this uh, development tree for internal data work, so I know it works. But okay, yeah, you have to get, get the device tree compiler is the thing you have to look for manually. Sure, I'm I'm explaining for others as well. Um, there is even a real push for the first time ever. We might actually be able to get a single image, a single Z image that will boot and run on a large number of totally different unrelated system, systems on chip um, we're, and, but by using device tree. Have people heard of device tree or flattened device tree? Again, I'm going off using jargon that may not mean much to everybody. Yeah, apparently, apparently the device tree compiler has been last uploaded in 2008, so I think you can get the package and upload the newer version yourself. Yeah, P2, well volunteered, all yours. <laughs> <laughs> Um, by using the device tree to pass um, hardware configuration around be between the bootloader, the kernel, and anything else that needs it, it means we might finally have a flexible enough system that we can run a single kernel. Um, that would make life so much easier for upstream, it would make life so much easier for, well, in, in Debian as well, we would be able to have a single, we wouldn't need to have the potentially 20, 30, 40 different flavors of ARM kernel if we want to support all of the, the new devices, we could do it with one, and that would be lovely. I thought the only exception was this LPA extensions we have in Project A15. <laughs> yes, <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, Debian ARM kernels at the moment, I mean, we have a lot of devices supported, but there's always a trade-off. Again, we have this huge multitude of different possible um, of different possible chips and systems that we can support but there's always a trade-off do we support every single one possible and need to then have 50 different flavors in the archive or do we target the most common ones and then other people are going to struggle they may need to maintain their own kernel we tend to go for the latter um, just be just for, sh for sheer manpower issues and also build time Obviously, the more, more flavors of kernel you have in the archive, the longer it takes to build. And traditionally, the ARM buildies have not been the fastest. So it, it would be a pain if we ended up trying to build 20 kernel flavors on a slow build D, and then a new kernel security update comes out, and it takes 36 hours to build. We don't want that. But th th that <laughs> might change if we get multi-core build Ds, mm. which mm. nowadays is yeah. more possible. Um, at the moment, we have a lot of V5 build Ds um, hosted by ARM. We have some host hosted at other companies. Um, I'm pushing for ARM to host the new ARM HF build Ds. Um, there are issues around that, and DSA have some questions about networking and things, which we're going to work through. 
I'm also hoping that we'll be able to update some of the existing buildies and replace those with newer, faster, shinier hardware. We're still working on it. Yeah. So, other That's distros. Right. Sorry. I wonder if there is a problem with too many kernel flavors and slow build. Why won't you just cross compile the bigger packages? Another what? case is like for, for example packages like Fennec or which which are even too big to to be compiled with with link time optimizations mm. and and for C plus plus code like in those packages it adds like twenty percent speed so even if 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 it takes more than four gigabytes of other space and uh, um, uh, cross building um, um, uh, those parts would um, um, give uh, a not simple uh, benefit and um, uh, uh, well arm is still um, uh, a lot um, slower than um, than other, other architectures mm. so uh, those benef benefits uh, are worth a lot uh, more yes <laughs> It's sorry, sorry. Um, the, so, so why would uh, you just, just uh, 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 massively cross compile mm. things? There are issues with yes, yeah, some of the bigger packages. We uh, we know that. I mean, I've been I've worked in the past on a Chrome browser on ARM, and, and absolutely, simply linking it, you can run out of address space. Um, this is not ideal. Um, we have had people looking more and more at cross compiling for um, the slow architectures. Wookie's going to be talking about so something about that in the very next talk in this room. Wookie? But if we can give Wookie a microphone, yeah. <laughs> thank you. he can probably say something more. Uh, yeah, so um, we had a conversation about this with FTP. I mean, the reason we don't cross-build things at the moment is because we're not allowed to if we're uploading it to Debian. It's simply not permitted. Um, so the question is, when should that be permitted? Are there good reasons why the archive should accept cross-build packages? And yeah, yeah, there are clearly advantages to building things that way. Um, but we have to believe that what we get out is actually right, uh, which fundamentally the, uh, the powers that be in release world aren't convinced of uh, yet. So we need to persuade people that it is reliable. Um, and uh, ultimately, it's a port decision. So uh, if the ARM people decide that, in fact, we think cross-build stuff is good enough, then we can decide to upload some. Uh, Basically, so but that's mm. something we're just starting to be able to do. So, uh. um, is this on? Yes. Yeah. Uh, how about using an emulator for buildies like QMU or something like that? Because you can run them them on uh, easily. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Okay, they are slow, but you have uh, there's lots of say PC hardware available. I, I believe it's oh, much more sure. abundant than ARM. We're no hardware. longer at the stage. That I can, that I think, were we we need to be thinking about emulating things for builds. Of course, you'd still end up with the same problem of address space because, of right. course, the emulated machine is still 32-bit, and, and and all that kind of thing. We now have sufficiently fast hardware available, I believe, to be able to make things work. I mean, okay, a, a current top-end, you know, eight-core AMD 64 machine will still run a lot faster than even the fastest ARM C, uh, single ARM CPU, but we're catching up. Nick. Steve, well, if we're just having one user land, or all ARM HF, why do you have to build it on every single different kind of board? Surely this is just a rebuilding the kernel for the different target board, and you just build the user land once on your fastest ARM board. Oh, core. yes, absolutely. Right. Sorry, I thought yes. you meant having so, multiple kernels. No, no, no. To rebuild oh, sorry. All the time the, the kernels is just for the different flavors of kernel package. The user land is consistent across all of it. Um, so, anything else? Andy, stand up. Uh, if it's required, I stand up, of course. So <clears throat> just uh, jumping back to a bit previous slide, we spoke about AML and AMHF. Um, so I understand the benefits of AMHF, but does that mean that we are just then going to fade away with AML? No. 
So it said means that we are just doubling the archive size for ARM? Yes. Um, What's that question? The reason for, yes, it, it, it's, a, it's a simple answer is un, unless the FTP masters, yes, I know, see, Neil, unless the FTP masters have a major problem with that, and I'm, I've been assured several times by Mark alone <laughs> <laughs> that there isn't a problem, yes, we are expecting to have two ARM um, ports in the archive. If we ask for a third, then there might be trouble. Um, again, this is why, I mean, going back four or five years when we first bought Army, started talking about Army L coming into the, into the main archive, the, the, the same question was brought up then of, well, how many ABIs do you want? We have thought about this. Army L is going to cover all of the older machines, or, you know, V4T. There's a re the reason why we're staying at V4T is so all of those people who have the open mocos, and, and old devices that cannot run anything newer, we're not going to abandon those folks. Well, at least not for a while yet. You know, um, they tend to be quite um, enthusiastic and know where we live and might come around to find us and ask us hard questions. So we're going to carry on supporting them for now. Um, and we will continue to support, I said at the moment, uh, the main buildings we have for Army L are V5 only. So we're not about to drop those machines either, clearly. Um, but there, are, there is such a, a gain to be had by having RMHF for the very latest machines that we absolutely want to do that. There is one more thing, is the FPU. Mm. We're building RMHF, we have a floating point unit, and there are several floating point units with, with an ARM course, and you can have, BF, we're building RMHF with BFP D16, which is compatible across most cores, but it happens that Neon uh, floating point unit is attached to more cores and it's becoming default. And I think it was only Tegra 2 which didn't have this floating point unit. But Tegra 3 is going to have Neon. So yeah. may, maybe somebody see a reason why not building Neon by default or changing this. Yeah. Cortex uh, A8, which is the the first generally available ARM v7 architecture chip mandated that you must have a NEON unit attached. NEON is a vector floating point unit similar to SSE on Intel. Um, not exactly the same design, not exactly the same features, but the same kind of thing. It's a SIMD architecture. Um, with Cortex-A9, um, ARM did not enforce that you must chip NEON, but most people did. As, as Hector points out, the Tegra 2, which is now a very, very common uh, chip in use in lots of machines, the AC100, lots and lots of the Android tablets out there, for example, are now going to the Tegra 2, which is a dual-core A9, runs quite fast, will support a gig of RAM. It's quite nice. Unfortunately, the fact that, that, that those are so common, it would mean that shipping, expecting Neon always, will not work. Um, it's a pain, but there's something we, we have to live with. Um, at some point in the future, we might consider moving to Neon by default, but it's not something I think we can countenance just yet. Um, it's one of those, it's similarly like we have user land libraries that will use MMX or SSE where possible. We may end up having to have, um, you know, different versions of libraries with different optimizations for this case, just the I same. Think, I think the best way is to have some kind of runtime detection. Exactly. Be because the GCC is just not smart enough to make good use of Neon mm -hmm. for general purpose code. The times you have advantages of Neon code is when you have some handwritten assembly. Yeah. Yeah. Auto vectorization in GCC is hard. I've, some of the toolchain folks who live in the office just down the, down the corridor from me at ARM keep on telling me this. And they know GCC a lot better than I do, so I'm not arguing. Um, if you do write hand optimized SSE or hand optimized Neon, you can get humongous gains. I mean, one of the things I, that I've got, I've still got a patch out standing I need to push into Chrome uh, for doing uh, UF to RGB color space conversion for video. Going from the initial uh, naive C implementation to one in Neon, I can see a factor of 14 improvement in speed. Um, you know, that kind of thing is so worth having, but you have to have fallbacks. You have to have equivalent code for when that hardware isn't available. Um, Wookie. So, yeah, so if you want to use Neon, and we have a question as Debian as to exactly how we manage that, because GCC now has a thing called IFUNC, which means you can put the Neon code in and the other code, and it will work out 
at load time which set of functions it should be using and whether to do the cool stuff because it's available on this hardware that it's running on or not, um, which is neat because it will just always work. Um, but obviously you have to build it in the right way, which is tricky and not how we do things right now. Uh, I guess we can. Or we can have partial archives of optimized for particular flavors. You know, we could, like we have loads of 686 um, packages for uh, x86 optimized so that your video actually goes fast. You could do the same thing for ARM and have a load of with neon packages, but only for stuff where it actually matters. But we have to decide which of those we're doing, yeah. or just both, depending on which package it is. Mm. It's something that we're still working on, and we don't want to annoy the FTP masters anymore, for example, with even more architectures. Or the release team. We like them. They're nice people. <laughs> so this, the work that, that we've been doing isn't just restricted to Debian. We're not, you know, as, obviously, just like in every other respect, we're not working alone. Fedora um, have had an ARM port, but it's still very much a second-class citizen. Uh, well, there are folks now working on... Go so, on. Sorry, uh, they started with Migo, actually, which is RPM-based, and they bootstrapped hard float. And they, yeah. Migo is used uh, uh, RPM user land to start mm. Fedora. Yeah, so the, the Fedora folks are, are getting on HF working. We're having discussions with them. Um, the Gen 2 folks, in fact, are slightly ahead of us as well. Uh, when Konstantinos started doing the OMHF Debian port, he was using some of the, some, a very limited subset of a Gen 2 system to use as a base, and then basically right. building binaries one at a time and bringing, bringing the system up. I mean, there's a number of us been there bringing up new systems. It's not fun. It's not easy. It, it, whatever you can use to get, to get uh, you know, an extra leg up, you use it. Um, the Majer folks, um, I've been told, um, are also looking into ar an, an ARM port, thinking ARM HF, maybe, maybe not. Um, but it's unofficial. It's unofficial at this point. Um, I'm not saying that, there's any, but that, that this is an exhaustive list by any means, I'm just giving examples. We've explicitly, just a uh, week before last, started up at Linaro uh, a cross-distro list um, obviously, Lenovo and ARM have a vested interest in Linux on ARM working well, no matter which distro. So far, we've been seriously targeting Debian and Ubuntu because that's where a lot of the, a lot of the momentum is. But we've set up this cross-distro list as a useful place where anybody can come and ask questions about porting to ARM. You know, come and get advice about how to target Neon. You know, all of those questions, we're quite happy to provide advice and generally just host, host a, a commu some community discussion. Right. We, how long do we have left? A couple of minutes? Right. We ha there are many, many other questions. The, these are ones that have just come up in the last week, just while we, people have been talking on IRC. Apparently, the, the Toshiba AC100 that we just showed is... It has a Tegra chip in. It's never going to be officially supported by the vendor, but there is, there are un, there is an unofficial Debian archive being worked on by Julian Andres Close. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's discussions about what we should do in terms of supporting GL. Um, as more and more of the mobile devices out there, of course, most of those are ARM, are coming out with GLES instead of full open GL we may consider building some of the archive differently depending on which architect you're on. That's a whole big um, mess that I don't want to get into right now, but it's something people should be considering. Um, we've been looking at a lot at cross-bootstrapping. Again, like we had a bit of a the beginnings of a discussion earlier, cross-building is a very useful tool when you're targeting a smaller architecture or when you're trying to bring up a new architecture We've got lots of cross-building, cross-bootstrapping work going on that I don't have time to talk about, but Wookie will soon. Um, and then again, optimizations like Neon or for the particular flavors of ARM processor, there are more things out there than just Neon. Um, there's so many things you can do to make the most of your hardware it can, that it can be a difficult choice to make, like, what's the default? Um, I just want to basically say thanks to obviously all the people in Debian who are helping with this, but also the people on the screen behind me who, who are actively helping to pay Debian people to work on making Debian and ARM work better. Um, thanks to those, Ginesi, Linaro, Toby Churchill, and obviously ARM. Um, do we have any more questions? You'll have to be quick. 
time's up. So if anybody would like to ask any more questions, please, obviously I'm going to be around, I'm wearing my, you know, my, my corporate t-shirt today. Um, Wookie and I are, uh, will, will be happy to tell you, you know, more about things, especially if you buy us coffee and beer. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. for attending the bar. Thanks for attending the BOF.